Hello, and welcome to the Full of Ship podcast. Real answers to real problems. With your host, Kyle Henderson, CEO and co-founder of Vision API, a podcast dedicated to demystify the chaotic, often turbulent world of ocean freight. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. I'd like to welcome our new guest on Full of Ship. We have Thomas Smith. He's a senior EDI implementation strategy consultant at Vision Net Systems. Tom has 25 years. Actually, no, correct me. 28 years. Is that right? We were chatting about that yeah. a minute ago. What's me 30? <laughs> he has a wealth of experience <laughs> in the EDI space, uh, working with EDI, working with XML, helping different companies across industries such as healthcare, merchandise and retail, transportation, logistics, consumer products, food services, you name it, exchange information in effective, actionable ways. And Tom, welcome. And is it Tom or Thomas? Tom's fine. I'm wonderful. Tom, welcome. Uh, you are an absolute angel to be focused on the really tough problems of trying to help companies work better together by sharing information. Uh, anything you'd add to that that quick intro? You know, what's been what what's that thirty years been like for you? Well, Kyle, thank you for for the great introduction, and and it's kind of it's been an interesting journey. The um, EDI, as you know, it's it's a standard that kind of can unite us, but it also can divide us because there's a lot of <laughs> friction in the supply chain, as you know, and EDI sometimes causes its own friction. Uh, I've been fortunate in that I've been involved not only with various industries, but the development of various industry standards, including transportation. Um, you know, transportation, uh, what else did I do? Greeting cards, wall board. I mean, there's dozens of uh, even floor covering B2B transactions, if you can believe it. But there's been dozens of uh, industry initiatives, standards initiatives, uh, that I've been involved with over the past nearly three decades. And, and it's been it's been exciting and it's been reassuring because I know after all that, when I started in this business, they told me EDI was dead. Nobody's going to use EDI. <laughs> and that was nearly 30 years ago. And, and <laughs> it's 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 just not going to happen. I, I hate to you know, burst anyone's bubble who thinks that they're coming up with a better, faster, stronger play. Uh, the reality is all those innovations – are going to fit together just nicely. It's going to be a wonderful future, and that's just the way I look at it. And it it's been that way for for some time. And for the uninitiated, what does EDI stand for? Let's say yeah, you're not really in this space in the, the data side of supply chain logistics where we focus. Sure. What does EDI um, stand for? Electronic data interchange. So it is really a broad way of looking at the exchange of transactions among trading partners electronically. So, you know, electrons, you know, EDI, the electronic piece uh, over the internet, over the telephone lines years ago, uh, at, at some point, if you really take it back to its uh, very beginning, you're, you're thinking about uh, the telegraph and Grant telegraphing Lincoln, telling him he needs more war materials and those goods getting loaded on trains and sent West. Um, you know, that, is really the beginning of, of stages, if you will, of, of EDI, in my view, right? You know, I've heard the story that uh, some of the first kind of specs around EDI were actually developed around the Berlin airlift uh, yeah. time period by the U.S. Army. Is, 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 there, is there any truth to that? That rings true as well, because when, when Eisenhower was done with the war, right, he had a number of things he wanted to do. Number one, he was a supply chain guy, so he wanted to make things move faster. So the first thing he started thinking about was the interstate highway system, which was is a godsend to anybody in supply chain. Nothing gets through to us as consumers without that. But secondly, that whole way that the military procures goods, right? How do you get those messages? How do you get that information from buyer to seller? And the U.S. government, as the biggest buyer of, of goods at that time, really needed a way to do this. So it really came out of World War II and the 50s and 60s really started to evolve. Um, into something more structured. Uh, the early structures go back, you know, to the big, I guess, the beginning of the Industrial Revolution with yeah. the, the chemical businesses and ocean freight, right? Once you got to wireless communications, it really became a, a godsend, right? Where's my stuff? Well, it's in the middle of the ocean on this boat, <laughs> though, but that's not important right now. <laughs> and 
So with your focus on the EDI, uh, your immense experience and the value you bring to the industry, you do this at a company named VisionNet, but specifically PartnerLink. Can you, can you maybe tell us a little bit more about PartnerLink by VisionNet and you know, who do you work with? Who's a life sure. can make it easier and you know, what's the value? Sure. PartnerLink is what you might want to call a hybrid integration platform. What PartnerLink does is it manages things like APIs and EDI integrations and, and transactions and brings them directly into the enterprise level system, right? So whether it's ERP or TMS or WMS or MRP, uh, so on, it doesn't really make a difference to us. It's a, it's a, you know, an order to cash transaction that might go into your order to cash process. It's a third party or a freight transaction that might re, uh, return information or, or extract information from your TMS or your WMS, or even your MRP might create orders uh, to send out to suppliers. And that might come back, you know, as a transaction message uh, about transportation back into that manufacturing process. And, and what makes PartnerLink different, you know, from the solutions that have been out in the past uh, 30 years is we're able to make more use of more modern technologies. And that gives us the ability to accommodate more types of data, more types of transactions, uh, various uh, integrations and greater volumes at, at higher speeds, you know, while increasing, you know, visibility reporting. And this is all in an out of the box solution. So it's all there. We've, we've, we've taken the time and, and let me just give you a little bit of background about VisionNet. We're a company that's 25 years in, in deep enterprise integration. So what, what that means is, you know, we install and build enterprise level systems for a lot of customers on a global basis. We have more than 7,500 people worldwide, 16 data centers. Our headquarters is in uh, New Jersey, in Cranberry, New Jersey. And uh, incidentally, it's right on uh, the, the 95 corridor, which is, you know, right back to Eisenhower, that interstate uh, corridor. Um, and what PartnerLink does is, you know, it takes advantage of that expertise, that depth of understanding of business to business transactions. And we've taken that experience. And when we set out to build PartnerLink, we, we, we set out to do three things, make it easy, keep it simple and put it every, put everything in one place. So we were able to take what we knew and what we had done in, in the CDI space, along with the experiences from our customers that weren't so good with the rest of the industry and bring that together in a modern cloud-based platform. So right from its very inception, it was intended to be cloud-based. So it's not like, you know, a second generation tool where we're bringing all these pieces back together. It is more of a, a primary generation tool where it was entirely built to be uh, that way. Like these, these pieces that if you, if you think about, the market as a whole, right? You have this transformation engine uh, and attached to it, you might have an FTP connector, an F SFTP connector, uh, connectors to different enterprises, AS2, a VAN connector, and you've got all these component parts. What we've done is we've included all them in part of the uh, infrastructure of PartnerLink, in part of the heartbeat. And it sounds like you guys deliver both, not just like amazing services around helping companies get all of this out of the box that you also provide technology around it. Uh, who we do. do you work Tech with? Yeah. Who do you work with? Who are, who are the people who get out the value out of what you guys do? Well, you'd be amazed because, um, you know, there's so many different supply chains in the world. I mean, we we work with importers and exporters, terminal operators, carriers, uh, intermodal and drayage carriers, even railway companies. So, you know, any type of transportation, 3PL, logistics, and then all the way through the supply chain from, you know, grocery products. One of our customers is the second largest producer of bananas and pineapples worldwide. Another customer in transportation is the, the fifth largest carrier in North America. So everything from, you know, general merchandise, fashion and apparel through consumer products, food, food service, grocery, convenience store, uh, any type of supply chain distribution, whether buying or selling, those are our typical customers. Even e-commerce retailers uh, and service providers and, and third-party logistics providers are customers. And is it safe to assume that your customers come to you because they have some type of challenge or problem they want to address? And if that's true, what are those problems? What are those challenges? Well, yeah, that, that is true. And the interesting thing about it is even when they have um, a solution in place. 
the number one problem that we're finding that the, the customer base is trying to solve is resiliency, right? So this, this whole great disruption thing, it, it wreaked havoc on supply chains around the world. It doesn't matter, you know, if you're in fruit or you're in electronics, there is some supply chain um, friction somewhere. And those really don't come to surface uh, very often. If you are uh, with an integrated solution or even a non-integrated solution, everything's hunky-dory, you don't really notice too much the friction. It's become part of your everyday life. You know, you have a workaround for these situations. But when you get into a situation like we did the past two years with, with this great disruption that we've had, um, people have time to think. And they have time to look and they have time to react. And they say, okay, how can I fix this problem in my supply chain. How, now that my primary supplier is out of action, how do I recover from that? How do I uh, make my systems more resilient? So they're really, um, they really want to talk to us at this point because they've heard, heard the same story for a number of years and it hasn't gotten much better. Maybe they have experience with all of the big players in the space and they want to talk to somebody different. Um, and, and resiliency really is dependent on visibility. If you can't see the problem, or you can't detect the issue and detect it quickly, you have a very hard time recovering from that. And I think a lot of uh, the market today has found that to be the case. Does that make sense? That makes sense. Makes a lot of sense. And uh, you know, speaking of like connecting with your customers, your partners, helping them solve problems, I heard uh, you know trade shows, conferences are 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 back to a certain extent. And I think they are. you were recently at was it the retail value chain. What was the name of that company? Right. RVCF, Retail Value Chain Federation. Okay. Um, retail value chain, uh, they do like a biannual. So they don't do really big meetings, but they do two of them a year. That's kind of their go forward. And they work with a lot of retailers. In fact, they're very good at helping the community of suppliers and even retailers communicate with one another because they have the same problems to solve. If you think about it, it's two sides of the same coin. The supplier can't get the information to the retailer fast enough the retailer wants more information faster, right? So this is a, a, an event where they get together. And what was amazing about that, and you know, and I don't often say that, you know, amazing about an event because they're events, right? We, in this space, we tend to do a lot of them. Um, but it what was nice about it is, you know, while it wasn't as large as it had been in previous years, it was at this point, um, you know, in this disruption cycle, uh, it was necessary. It was welcomed and it was extremely productive. So, you know, like other areas of the supply chain, retail supply chains are working on getting back on track, right? So it's it's not a, uh, so much a function of getting, you know, getting back on track or getting back to work. You know, what broke or simply didn't perform as expected during this disruption is being looked at and looked at differently. So, like I said, you at, at, at one point, you know, you have friction in the supply chain, you find a workaround then that becomes ingrained in your business process. And this time, I think people had a big enough break from their day-to-day -day operations to be able to take a, a different look and review those processes and look at those that are not able to keep pace anymore with increased needs, You know, like onboarding trading partners. It might not have been a problem because eventually those trading partners get connected. But when you're in a situation where your, your key supplier or your key partner is unable to perform for whatever reason, maybe it's uh, short staffed, maybe it's, you know, closures, maybe it's they're not able to go to work in a factory um, and you need a, a secondary supplier or a secondary source or a secondary partner, um, adding tr more trading partners becomes increasingly important. And if your current solution is not able to perform, you know, physically or as a service, um, and they're not able to keep pace with what you think your needs are, then, you know, you, your customers are going to look. And, and that's what I think has happened. I think those customers have looked and I think they've come back, um, you know, like, like I haven't seen them in years, you know, very excited about the event, very uh, energized to be there and uh, very productive while they were there. Yeah. How, how was the energy? Like it, this was, was this your first in-person event in a long time? It really was. I mean, I, I, I do this a lot. So I've been doing this for the past well, 30 years, nearly um, going to different events and so forth. But this one was different because it was a real focus, right? You could, you could grab their attention. People wanted to reach out and talk to other people. Uh, and it was, uh, it was what, Arizona. What were they, I don't, what were they right? talking about? What were the hot topics? Oh, it was amazing. I mean, we went, 
we went with a couple of ideas, um, you know, our normal, the normal spiel, right? Like the normal booth kind of setup. But we also handed out at the event um, like a, this little uh, card. And what we did, and since we started talking to your team last summer, we had, you know, been working on what we call instant ocean visibility. And that is, you know, the, the Vision API partnered with PartnerLink. And we're able to bring that to market. And we've we've been test marketing, if you will, like as we're going through our normal sales cycle, talking to customers that might have an interest in container traceability and so forth. And we decided that uh, as our, our VCF approach, that this would be a good opportunity to really test market the response. And we we couldn't have been more pleased with the outcome. Amazing. That, I mean, I love, I love hearing that. It sounds like they loved hearing that. And so that was hot topic for the event. What, what was some of the outlook that you heard people talking about? Like, you know, people's outlook over the next two years, what's, what's going to change? Well, I think, and what's going to stay the same. <laughs> yeah. I think the first thing that's going to change is, and let me just tell you about the, the, the people that were there. Number one, people go to events, they do this on a regular basis. And this is going back years, right? Um, taking two years off from that whole structure that, or, and it's an organizational structure. If you think about it. these are peers working together with, to solve common problems and RVCF is perfect for that. Um, when they do that, they have the same conversations year after year. We have to do something about, you know, this thing or that thing or the other thing in their particular supply chain could be, you know, hangers or bags or packaging or, you know, some new law in California, um, you know, or, or some other state. Um, and they have these conversations, but this year was different. Uh, the customers at these event at the event this year were interested in solving problems and interested in, in talking to other people about their particular problems. Usually it's a shared interest, but this was different. They, the shared interest was not just getting past this disruption, but how to get back on track and improve uh, their, their supply chains. And now it's what was different. So the theme, I think, really can be down to, um, you know, I need to solve my problems and how can you help me solve my problems? And I'm very interested in hearing what you have to say, where in previous you know, decades, it's been more of a drive-by. You know, I, I am somewhat interested or I'm specifically interested in talking with this guy about his stuff. Uh, this was much more open, much more friendly, and much more engaged. They were interested in talking pretty much with everybody about you know, different things in the supply chain because that, things weren't taken off the table unnecessarily. And when we approached this market, you know, from that perspective with the, um, you know, with the little three by five card uh, that had instant ocean visibility on it, kind of like the, uh, the backdrop here, they were extremely interested. And even though it wasn't their part of the business per se, they might've been in, you know, chargebacks or uh, promotions or just a, a, a particular product line, they did know people that they were working with that were involved in that. And they were really going they were like, I've got your card. I'm taking it back to my team. Here's my card. Make sure you reach out to me. So it was much different from that perspective. Yeah, we've seen a lot in this space. And I, I've been in ocean visibility since 2015 or so now. And that that tone of the conversation, we've also heard change. You know, it, it went from, a, you know, I, I have a background in developing products and we talk about products by their requirements. And we have this, this old acronym called Moscow, which stands for must, should, could, won't. And it helps you understand like iteration one of the product. What is the must? Well, let's get all the musts done. We don't need to do any shoulds or coulds. Understanding right. the won'ts are important. But it sounded a lot, what we've been hearing the space, and it sounded like you were hearing the same, that for many companies, this type of visibility has kind of shifted from like a could or maybe a should to more of a should and a must. And, exactly. and, you know, one of the things that we have to do on our side to, to help fulfill that must need is kind of breaking down data silos in a lot of way, because we, we make two promises in our product. It's instant, immediate access to ocean event data, and it's the highest quality data set we can measure in the market. Those are the two things we deliver. Very, very simple promise. But to do that, we have to do an immense amount of engineering work around tapping into data silos everywhere. Is data silos a problem that you end up having to address quite often? 
or is is that something from a bygone era? Um, it's kind of it's kind of interesting to put it that way. A couple of things we we see is on the re- reliability and visibility piece, right? So, you know, the ability to deliver complete data sets, ergo information, when and where it's needed. That's that's where I think the, the a bigger part of change needs to occur. Um, so when we're able as a as a community, right, to better able to gather the necessary information and not only predict, rather fill in the blanks with near certainty of a, a misstep maybe in the collection process or in the, the data delivery mechanisms. Um, so we can deliver that information as a steady stream to, to our consumers, you know, when and where they need it. Uh, that's important. And then the second part of that is visibility, right? So even though we may have the ability to deliver that information to them, and it's reliable data, it's the most reliable data on earth in, in some respects. Um, but when visibility becomes disconnected from that core user, that host, and they have to go into a secondary system to get it, then we lose that visibility. And I think that's where the, the silos are really starting to have an impact. Because if, if you think about the supply chain as links in a chain, because that's really the best description I've ever heard. I, we were talking about that earlier today, that these links only interact with them, you know, with each other on, on that very connection point where the two links meet. Well, it's a chain. So the links on the ends don't necessarily know what's going on in the middle. Yep. So when those and their silos, right, it, when they don't connect, when they don't share information across those those verticals or silos, or in this case, links, you just have a bunch of metal O's, yep. right? They're not a chain anymore. It's just metal O's. Yeah, it's like we've that, done a good job on like the physical chain. The digital chain has some gaps here and there. Yes. It has and, a lot. And you work closely with forwarders. You work closely with the shippers, the receivers, the cargo owners. Um, I guess from from those different perspectives, where uh, where are the pain points they're experiencing in terms of missing links in the data chain? And I, I'm assuming it they you know a forwarder might say something different than a shipper, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I think um, I think some of it comes from a lack of a, a base of understanding on, on the consumer side of that, right? So on the consumption side, they say, I want to know when it's delivered. But what they don't realize by asking for that narrow of a requirement, like they must have, I must have delivered, they're missing the, the larger opportunity, right? So um, tendered for delivery, uh, arriving at delivery location and departing delivery location. We, we know the, the vehicle or the, the container hasn't hasn't been there for coffee. It's not a, a, a greeting. It's not just a visit. That there is an actual f- activity that happens in that space. But when you look for delivered and your whole data reliability lies in delivered, all those messages that come before that are indicators of where it is in the, in the supply chain. And if they narrow the focus, then they lose visibility on their own. So I think there's a little bit of that going on as well. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. I follow you there. Earlier, I, I wanted to come back to this. I made a little note. You had mentioned that PartnerLink, part of the value uh, that you guys deliver and part of the, the, the pain you resolve or the challenge you help your, your customers and partners overcome is uh, putting the right information in the right place at the right time. And it, I, I've heard some of those places are things like SAP, NetSuite, CargoWise. Uh, what is it like to help your partners and customers integrate with those systems from your perspective? You know, what, what are companies need a solution like yours? Uh, I'm, I'm sure you've heard, oh, we'll do it for ourselves at some point. You know, wh- what is it, what is it that you guys make the easy button for when it comes to putting <laughs> the answers in the right place at the right time? And I like the way you put that, the easy button, because that's exactly how, you know, we deliver the product, right? So, you know, there's a lot of these, a lot of iPass and, and software as a service providers out there that say, we've got everything. We've got a million connections and 100,000 APIs. Here you go. Uh, and it comes with a big invoice, a box of bolts and, a, you know, a bag of wrenches. And that's really the problem because, and I, I see this not only with our customer base, so I see it with 
prospects, if you will, coming to us after having done this, they come back to us and they go, yeah, we, we looked at you. We looked at a couple other guys. We, we took the path of, you know, wrenches and bolts. And, and we figured out after six months, it cost us a ton of money that we don't know how to do this. So we didn't want that to happen with any of our customers for any reason. So when we deliver PartnerLink to a, a client, we deliver it installed. So even if it's the smallest of migrations, we make sure that we accommodate, you know, all of their transactions. It may only be a few trading partners and they can do the rest if they want or, they, or we can do them. But we make sure that interaction and that integration is complete end to end for the entire set of transactions. At the very least, the, the, the client has a roadmap to follow, you know, and a path. And that's really the best method because you, you can sell or, or create a great solution, but unless you deliver it to the door and make it easy for them. It's installed. It's done. It's running. You know, yeah. uh, cars running in the driveway, engine on, keys in the ignition, doors yeah. open. Then it's it's not worth the the, the risk, right? Because now you're going to bog down your team who is already overloaded, right? We're at a 85 percent employment, right? So mm-hmm. I, you already have 15 percent shortfall. Call it 10 because we'll we'll agree that five percent, you know, is squishy is there. Yeah, right, it's squishy there, right? So we'll yeah. take that. We'll take a. You know, we'll take that 85 percent. We'll take the 10 percent, uh, you know, less people than we need. They're already overworked. And, you know, yeah. I don't know about you. When I go home at the end of the week, there's still work on the table. Yeah. You know? and, and they're not necessarily focused on tasks that are kind of force multiplier tasks. Something like as like uh, understanding how to increase efficiency or building a deeper customer relationship by sharing the right information. Exactly. It's tasks such as go find out if the boat arrived. <laughs> <laughs> where's my ship yeah right. absolutely yeah um yeah you couldn't be more right because that i think that really takes some of the pressure off because if we give them the ability to come out of the gate with success and that's really critical you know they they've done the implementation it's successful on day one that's great and and what we find after that interaction and i'll give you an example one of our customers came to us in the early part of the uh, stages of the process said hey we're doing 3 million transactions. This is a big deal. It's a big company. And we, and we looked at them and, and I remember making the note saying to myself, and this is a month, right? 3 million transactions a month. I remember thinking, this is not a 3 million transaction a month company. This is a 30 million transaction a month company. Jump off, right? Yeah. So I remember going into this with that in my mind. And when we completed four weeks later, you know, we got the first stages of production going. Eight weeks, we had 700 trading partners live. Um, I remember going back to them and, and my team and saying, what are we doing? What's the volume looking like? And they're like, you know, blue past 3 million, blue past 5, 15, 20. We got the 30 million transactions. And I'm like, that's more like it. Now, fast forward a year and we're looking at 60 million transactions. So when we were done, the customers came to us and they said, you know, very simply, we didn't know what we couldn't see. Yeah. And you know, we have since, you know, with our product, and it really has less to do with um, their business than it does with the efficiency we're able to deliver. Yeah, that um, classic quote of the unknown unknowns. <laughs> yeah, they just couldn't see it. And they yeah. said, we are, you know, we're, we're having great success. You know, this is a great quarter. This is a great half kind of thing. What else can you do? You know, what else can, what else are we not seeing that you can help us with? And that was, I think, uh, an eye opener for us. You know, we, we, we knew we were good at it. We knew we could get the job done and, and we delivered what we just didn't really grasp the depth to which it would impact somebody else's business. So partner link is an easy button out of the box. Now, the question in my mind is uh, what panes of glass do you put this great information into? I, I, I have notes on SAP, NetSuite, CargoWise. You know, what, what are the, the most common platforms that you're, you're helping your customers get more value out of? And part of the reason I ask is listeners might want to know because if they're using it, they might want to talk to you guys. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, we integrate um, with more than 75, I mean, this is today out of the box, more than 75 uh, enterprise level you know, ERP, WMS, TMS systems, uh, including SAP. So if our customer, you know, that we're talking to has, you know, something like a one, three, five year plan, they're on, you know, Oracle ECC or a version of uh, SAP and they want to go to the cloud version, it's a couple of years away. 
this is a really good fit because we understand both. We keep up with both. So you're you're never going to go out of date with partner. Like you don't have to buy two instances. It can talk to both of them at the same time. So if you're a large enterprise and you're in multiple countries, great, because now you can phase in your countries with one solution. If you've got uh, an acquisition and you're trying to converge into one enterprise level system, you can do that with, with, this pro- with this platform because it has that capability built in. So I think we give them options that they haven't heretofore thought about. Everything to this point has been, well, we'll wait and see what happens with this system or we'll wait and see what happens with that system. In the meantime, you know, the business is suffering, the visibility suffering. You know, yeah. I have people less people than before chasing down containers and ships and and loads and everything else. And it just makes sense. If we can do this, we can get this increase in visibility uh, and an improvement in service and and, and lift to the business, then it it virtually pays for itself. And it really helps that those next step uh, take place quicker. To build on that and risk opening a Pandora's box. What do you think needs to change in the industry around data, reliability, visibility for the masses? I think they need to take a, um, a different view, right? So I mentioned, you know, data reliability. I think we have reliable data. I think there are some gaps in there that most people involved in the supply chain may or may not understand. I think the technicians might see more of it. Um, that they can help open their eyes to, here is an opportunity. You may not need it today, but you may need it in the future. In the meantime, it'll be here for you. I think that's critical. One of the things I learned today from one of our customers is um, they were interested in uh, available uh, available to ship, Mm -hmm. right? So that was their only interest. They want to do a catalog message, which, you know, an inventory message, which gives is based in quantity. I mean, the available to ship thing is if I have a quantity more than one, it's available or more than zero, it's available to ship. Yeah. So, but they're, they're like, no, no, we only store the dates. I said, that's fine. I said, but we're going to help you. Yeah. It, they've never done EDI. Let's, so, let's they, kind of future proof this data if we're going to do the work. Absolutely. To, to let's, organize let's it. Let's build yeah. a catalog message. Let's build an inventory message. Let's do that in such a way that you get what you're looking for today. Yeah. Fully understanding. And this is a new D365 instance, in fact. Uh, so it's a retail customer who's moving forward with their D365 plan. Uh, they've been kicking this around for two years. So they're finally getting started. The EDI becomes part of that part and becomes a part of that. And we said, you know, we understand where you're, we understand where you want to be. We also understand where we expect you to go, where you're going to go on your own, whether we're with you or not, you're going to get there at some point, but you need that visibility now and we can give it to you. You know, we'll deliver the payload that you want today in your enterprise, not a problem but we'll have cached all that other data. So if you get to it within the next seven years, it'll still be here because it's all built into the platform, right? So there's no separate archive with, yep. with partner, like it's built in. So that stuff is, and it's the same interface. So you can actually go back and look at inventory levels over time. If you need to, you know, now you want to do some analytics, you're two years later, right? From yep. today, 2024, you want to do some analytics, you already have data. So let's let's start with that premise. It doesn't cost them anything more. They had this inkling for this transaction anyway. It was in the contract yep. to do it. Let's build it the way it should be built. Let's design it the way it should deliver uh, the maximum amount of value over the next you know one, three, five, 10, 15, 20 years. And let's do it now. Something you said uh, piqued my interest. You mentioned the technicians can sometimes know a bit better about gaps or issues in the data. Yes. Uh, we, we often throw the phrase around here that a problem rarely survives its thorough description. And that, that maxim uh, we take to heart when, because the second promise is data quality for us and the completeness of data is part of data quality. Um, I have an expectation of what's complete is part of data quality. W- what challenges or how about, I'll put it this way, for um, companies you're working with when you first show up, what's the status quo of them understanding their data quality? And with completeness, latency, let's say like a, your, your ability to fill the gaps or enrich it in some way, being these elements of data quality, uh, your off the street company, 
how good are they at, at measuring and understanding their data quality? I, I don't, I think, I think that takes a level of experience that not every customer has in house. And I think that is where the opportunity lies for, for, for guys like you, frankly, who have the wherewithal and the insight to say, we know that this, globally speaking, this is a blackout zone. We don't know when this ship's going to leave port, if anybody will ever tell us. You know, it's not going to happen on terrestrial, right? It yeah. may happen on satellite, but we may not know when this when this ship leaves Thank port. Thank you, China. <laughs> Recently right. yeah. shutting down exactly. all the terrestrial AIS data feeds. Yeah. At some point, um, you're going to receive a signal that says, you know, it's it's reached this place in the ocean. You can predict very accurately how you know when it left port. So you can fill in those information gaps. So when you get that next signal, and that's huge for us, right? So those data points for serviceability, for reliability of, of ocean carriers, for reliability of relationships in, in this you know, international trade that we're all involved in is, is, is huge, you know, and puts everybody on a level playing field, right? Yeah. So, you know, a, a ship leaves Norway in the middle of the night, another one leaves China, you know, what, you know, how are they converging? How is this working for me? And if you don't have all those data points or you can't reliably predict those data points, you can't really uh, analyze them fairly. Uh, even the best analyst is not going to be able to do that. But the the understanding that that they 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 are missing an understanding, mm -hmm. you know, because who the heck would know that? Um, you know, China is blacking out certain you know phone systems, terrestrial telephone systems, to you know disable whatever. You know, um, that's not like common knowledge. That's not something your yeah, everyday yeah. supply chain <laughs> guru is going to know off the street. They might have an inkling, or they might not. Um, a complete understanding is really it has great. to be your focus. Oh, it has, it has to, to be a be. focus, right? It has to be a focus. And you guys, you know, from my perspective, you guys do an outstanding job of that. I love that. That's thank you. That by, for me is the best part. I've been having the same discussions with with customers for the land uh, operation. Right, arrived at, departed. Right, there's a delivery thing in there that may not happen till that driver shows back up at the warehouse. You know, it just doesn't happen for twelve, eight, ten, nope. twelve hours. You don't know. Um, but that being able to detect that is, is paramount. So it sounds like uh, from like the land side, you're just mentioning that partner link thinks about data quality as well. How, how do you guys manage a conversation around data quality with your, your customers? We, we tend to take a, a coaching perspective with it, right? So it's more of a, uh, it, it's a more of a design discussion. So, you know, frequently we, we have these, well, we don't frequently have all these conversations. It's not, it's not a, a frequent event. But when we have these conversations, it's frequently tied to a customer entering the space, right? They've had some visibility issues. They've had some visibility delivered to them, but they've missed some other opportunities. And now they want to fix them. They have holes. So when they come to us with these holes that they want to fix, we, we try to normalize that conversation into the ebb and flow of these transactions the way they would normally occur, you know, in nature. I'll put the air quotes on it, right? In, in our natural environment. Um, and, and here's the process steps they go through. And in your particular industry, these are the uh, interest points that you're going to want to talk to. So even though you're only delivered in that de interested in that delivery message, there's a whole series of events that happens. So when you don't get that message, you could go, where's my stuff? Yeah. You know, and then be able to find where your stuff actually is, which is key. You know, now you can see how long is it going to take to get there? It's like those, uh, and I'll use the ocean voyage, right? It's that, it's that five days from port as the ship is circling the Atlantic in hurricane season, right? It's five days from port. Well, that's been a <laughs> yeah. week. Yeah. Yes. Well, you know, if we superimpose that on a weather map, you really can see what's going on. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of curious because uh, you've been in the industry longer than I have. How has the C-suite of companies thought about data and how has that, that the series of thoughts changed throughout the years? Yeah, I think, I think what you're seeing now is, and I'll call it a squeeze play because that's really the only way to describe it. <laughs> so the, the C-suite, the C-suite team is interested in cool, new, sexy and filling holes, right? This is a, 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 an executive order. This is, you know, on the order of magnitude is important to the business, important to the core. The other side of that are the, the technicians and the analysts 
that have a particular problem that they're trying to solve. So they're trying to bubble up the issues and the, the executives are trying to push down the issues. So it becomes a squeeze. And when you can find consistency between those two parties where they agree that, yes, this is something we need to solve. We need to solve it today and we can get right on it and we have a solution. Um, it's just, it's great because everybody sees things clearly. It doesn't become a, a, a push from one side or the other, you know, and then at that point, all the parties are much happier with the outcome. Curious, uh, what, what have been the communication challenges around understanding one another uh, between the C-suite in the boardroom and the technicians in the basement, because you're mentioning like the technicians in the basement, they have needs. The C-suite has needs, but I've not always seen effective communication to set what would be sensible prioritization between the parties. I'm just curious how how have you? Where, what's the best you've seen? Like who who's who's a you know in that classic kind of uh, consultant analysis, the leaders and the laggards. What are the leaders doing? Well, I think. I'll be honest with you. I think you're seeing that more today than ever before, right? So if you take the normal uh, software buying curve, right? You got the yeah. early adopters and you got the laggards at the end and everybody in the middle is kind of thinking their way through it, right? Thinking their way through the problems, working out, negotiating the squeeze, trying to figure out how to go. Then you mix in an event like this great disruption, the first yeah. one, the beginning of this, which throws a, uh, it throws a Gartner curve in there, right? It throws this big, holy crap, I got to fix something. And then it slows down a little bit. Now you've got an intersection there where it's starting, this emergency curve is is, is merging with the, the normal curve of doing things. Yep. Throw in a second curve, right? Which is the delay in the supply chain curve. It happened yep. a couple of months, maybe a year later, it depends on how you look at it. Now you've taken this adoption curve and you've cut a hole in it and you've lengthened it. So that early adopter curve where they're just starting to investigate and thinking about it has gotten bigger. Mm -hmm. So 40% of the market, according to some of the surveys, has, has done something or is working on yeah. something. But the by far, the majority of the market, 60 to 90% on the other side of that, 60% is clearly shopping and looking, but maybe as much as 90% aren't really sure that they've, they've completed uh, what they were doing. Right. So they still have some work to do. So I think for, for operators like, like you and myself and others in this business, um, there's a huge opportunity, not only for us, but for our partners and our customers, because, you know, there's a lot of thinking going on in the smaller staff that they have, and they're more able to work together and communicate and move the ball along. So I think, you know, from a communication standpoint, this is a prime time for uh, that market to start talking with one another on their own teams. And we saw that at our VCF. You know, we said, let's test the market. Let's wave around our card and see if we get any you know, activity. And what we were finding was, you know, the customers were grabbing that card and saying, I'm taking this back to my peer, my partner, my associate in another part of the organization. He or she needs to see this. Um, and here's my card. Let's, let's, let's set something up. I'll bring them to the meeting. It sounds like, a, so I, I had heard for years, especially on the data side, how can the data help my company better navigate black swan events? Yeah. And a lot of what's been happening with the disruption, it, you know, initially people thought it was a black swan event, maybe like, uh, you know, the ever given being stuck in the Panama, uh, not the uh, Suez Canal. That's a black swan event. Exactly. But we're kind of in a black swan era right now. Maybe the other way of saying, uh, no, if it's an era, it's actually change. It's not just an event. So it sounds like what you're hearing is the majority of the market has come to realize that, oh, no, this is actually a change period now. This is, we need investment, we need evolution, we need to not just think different, we need to do different. Is that a fair summarization? It It's getting to that point. Yeah, I would say it is because it's not, you know, it depends on who who's doing the analysis, right? I'm looking at it saying... I've got two consecutive events. It's it's now a series, right? I've, I can yeah. connect them. There's a line there. So, you know, th there is no expectation because there have been so many, and I'll say these micro black swan events, right? Two big ones, a lot of little ones in between. Is is this a tendency now? Is this something we need to be concerned with? And, and I think that's kind of given it more weight that, you know, whoa, wait a minute. I do really have to think about this because 
if 15% of the market isn't showing up for work, you know, now what? Yeah. How do I process manual invoices? How do I keep track of my freight? How do I find these containers when the boss says, where's my stuff? Because that's, you know, where's my stuff? And <laughs> I have to do this, and but all my peers are going. I'm Sometimes the there's some expletives sprinkled in there too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the last one in the office. Nobody is going to do this but me. So, yeah. you know, it becomes more and more important. And what if Julie gets hit by a bus? That's a really bad thing. So those things start creeping into everybody's reality. Yep. Holy cow, if Julie got hit by a bus, what trouble would we be in? It's um, a so combination of resiliency stuff. and uh, might might I say that, you know, if if the pain is being thought of as needing to increase resiliency, that's one edge of the sword. But maybe the other edge is agility. How how are you hearing companies thinking about data and information as a way of increasing their agility, which is by its nature a risk reduction capability. Like, you know, if, as you're mentioning earlier, it's like, Hey, my primary supplier is not available. The entire country shut down. You know, what do you, do we, what are we going to do? How do you, how quickly you adapt is your agility. So are you hearing people use the A word? And I'm not saying that as an expletive. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I totally get that. So yeah. yes, they, they are, because what they're finding is the solution that they have that they thought was agile really isn't that agile. It was agile in a static environment, meaning I can make do. It was fine. If it didn't work exactly as I predicted, then I've got to work around and everything's normal because we're at full employment. I've got all the jobs filled and everybody's doing their jobs well. Everything changed, you know, post, uh, you know, disruption. Everything changed. So now I've got less people. So now the friction is now be able to be uh, felt more. So agility that I thought I had kind of went out the window. So they say, I got to recover this agility. So now it's, the thinking is, well, recovering agility, it, that's resilience. I have to be able to bounce back and I got to be able to do it quickly. I definitely have the wrong tool. I need another tool or I need a different tool set or I needed to look at it a different way. And w when they come to that realization, I think they have more to talk about, not only with themselves, which I think is critical, uh, but with people like us in order to help them better understand their own supply chains. Um, it's, it's great when you have a supply chain, it's working well and, and you can see everything, right? You see both ends of it. it. It's wonderful. But when one of those links gets out of sync with the rest of them, it, it just doesn't connect anymore with the rest of the chain. Now there's a problem and you don't know how to fix it because you're, you know, you're three or four steps removed. So how do you fix that? How do I get around this hole, yeah. right? The China, the South China Sea is a perfect example. How do I get around that? You know, that is very difficult. You guys have found a way to get around. I think it's great. That that's the kind of thinking that I think we need to get in, not only the boardroom, but the basement as well. My last question slash comment. Um, if resiliency and agility are key parts of the conversation, especially with how data, access to data, the right information in the right place at the right time is impacting that. I'm curious, how have you heard companies talk about not just resiliency and agility coming out of this, but growth? Especially since you're mentioning so much about, you know, it's, I don't have enough people to, to work the way I used to work. So right. software is helping my people, uh, you know, work at a, a level that we're amplifying them or magnifying their ability. What could that mean? And are you hearing any anyone talk about what that could mean about the growth for their company? And not just in people, I mean, in revenue, business, all, yeah, all the yeah. metrics and, they measure. We're seeing that firsthand. Um, you know, there is an upside. Anytime there's a, a, a market collapse or consolidation of any kind, there's always something else taking off. Um, and we've seen that, you know, we, we've seen that with our business, right? The first, the paper goods and the frozen food aisle. You know, you follow your way around the grocery store. You don't let a good crisis market. go to waste. <laughs> well, no, I don't think it's that. I think it's more of, you know, we know, you know, if you've been in this space uh, any length of time, I started in grocery. So I'm yeah. very sensitive to grocery. So when I visit a grocery store, it's, it's not the empty shelf that concerns me. It's the empty slot. Right. So there, there are pain relievers out there, yeah. but not this pain reliever. And that fact that, that, that this pain reliever is not visible impacts a whole number of people, a whole group of people, a whole community, maybe. Right. The whole town might be dedicated to producing, I don't know, asparagus, you know, or, or some, you know, kind of yeah. a farm product. That's their 
that's their living. That's how they, they earn their, their keep. Um, that empty slot has an impact. And those are the people I want to help. So I think when that happens, you, you get a reaction from the market that just kind of says, we have to go together. We have to work together and, and try to solve some of these problems. And I think that's a big help with, with, with guys like you. Well, Tom, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you today. Thank you for being such a honest, genuine guest. You know, I really appreciate the information you shared, the insights you had. Uh, any last comments you want to make? Any final questions you might want to ask? Any any challenges you want to place to the audience? Um, don't be afraid to ask questions. Internally, externally, I think that's important. I think it's important to talk with your people and ask them what they're seeing. Um, I think as consumers, and, and we're all consumers, I think it's important to look around as a consumer and try to understand things as a consumer, maybe of your product. You might you might work with a product that you, you don't use, right? Um, but even if that's the case, you have to look at the product through a consumer's eyes. And if they're if, the, if that consumer reaches for your product and it's not there and it's not on the shelves, they want to know where it's in, you know, where it's at, wh what's going on with it. We live in an, an Amazon world, right? So you, you place an order and you get an email that says the label's been printed. We haven't picked up your package yet, but yeah. there's a box in this building and we've printed the label. They're going to meet probably today. Yep. Um, you get that level of information at Amazon. That detailed level of information exists in everybody's supply chain. It's there. You just have to access it and you just have to create and cultivate those relationships in order to get it, uh, you know, get it into your system. And that's where you want it. You want it at your fingertips, just like your Amazon account is today. It pings your phone. It, it sends you an email, sometimes to the point of annoying, but th those can be adjusted. <laughs> but that's the kind of thinking that I think, today's supply chain uh, people need to, to have and, and share among themselves. I second the motion. Thank you, Tom. Thanks. Thank you again for your graciousness. We appreciate you being on Full of Ship. And until next time, have a great one. I hope to see you in person at a conference sometime soon. Yes. Looking forward to it. Talk to you soon. Cheers. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you for joining Kyle and his guest on the Full of Ship podcast. Be sure to subscribe and tune in next time as Kyle continues to demystify ocean carrier tracking with his future guests.